Let me start by welcoming everyone this evening to what I hope is a really fun and informative hour of your life. My name is Aaron Boster, and as always, I want to thank you for learning about MS with me. I'm the founder of the Boster Center for Multiple Sclerosis, where we care for families impacted by MS from around the globe. I also uh, maintain a YouTube channel where I put out educational videos on MS once a week. Um, I am hosted today by MS Focus, the MS Foundation, an absolutely fantastic organization. I have loved working with these guys over the past years. They do a bang up job. And so I wanna thank you guys formally for bringing me back so that I can talk uh, to everyone once again. Today, I have uh, a, a series of discussions prepared. I'm very, very excited to share how to fight back and live your best life despite having MS. And if you're gonna take some notes, there's really only five things that you need to write down. Years ago, I realized that there were four things that I was aware of that slowed down multiple sclerosis. And obviously I want all people impacted by MS to be doing all four. And so I came up with this cutesy saying that I wanted you to be four for four in your fight against MS. Why four for four? Because there were four things I could think of. And that's why my clinic number is 304-3444. Today, I'm adding a fifth element, and really, this will be one of the first times formally um, I talk about being five for five in your fight against MS. And so, for starters, the whole concept here really harkens back to what can you do to live your best life despite having MS? It's a fool who thinks that they're going to fix this disease by taking a pill twice a day or once a day or taking an infusion. Really, if we are gonna live our best lives, despite having multiple sclerosis, we need to do more than just take a medicine. And there are five things that we're gonna be talking about today that I want you to do to live your very, very best life. Number one, don't smoke stuff, right? So don't smoke stuff. Smoking increases the risk to develop MS. In fact, People that smoke are twice as likely to develop MS compared to the general population. So you double your risk by smoking. Now, if you already have MS and you smoke, you speed up your disease by almost 50%. That means that smoking is the largest modifiable risk factor in MS, hands down. You can impact your disease more by not smoking than you can by most of the old MS drugs. And not smoking is one of the five key things that I need you to do if we're going to do the best we can living our best life despite having multiple sclerosis. Now, there's a lot to talk about as it relates to smoking. And I, if you noticed today when I started talking to you, I said, don't smoke stuff. So I am a medical marijuana recommender. I recommend uh, cannabis as medicine to patients for symptoms when it's appropriate. But I do not recommend taking a carbon-based life form, lighting it on fire, and then sucking in the smoke, whether that be tobacco or cannabis, because that's also very, very pro-inflammatory. I don't recommend that you smoke stuff. And today, I want to take that idea of not smoking, and I want to flush it out, because we're talking about not smoking so that you can live your best life with MS. And in reality, it turns out that any cardiovascular risk factor increases MS progression. You heard me right. If you have uncontrolled high blood pressure, you are driving your MS disability faster than if you didn't. If you take a group of people with poorly controlled diabetes and MS and compare their outcome to people with well-controlled diabetes and MS, the poorly controlled diabetics end up neurologically more disabled than the population that had good control of their diabetes. If you have high cholesterol, if you have uncontrolled high blood pressure, if you are obese or have an inactive lifestyle, these are all cardiovascular risk factors. And unfortunately, what we now know to be true is that uncontrolled risk factors speed up progression of neurological disability. So if you wanna live your best life, I don't want you to smoke cigarettes because it speeds up MS. But I also dare, I double dog dare you, I challenge you, to kick it up a notch and to consider addressing all cardiovascular risk factors. If you are morbidly obese, you're at increased risk of progression of disability. If you are inactive, same thing. If you have poorly controlled diabetes, 
or high cholesterol or very commonly uncontrolled hypertension, you may be speeding up your disease process without even realizing it. So what do we do about this? Well, first of all, quitting smoking is super duper hard. It's very, very hard to quit smoking. And the data would suggest that just quitting cold turkey almost never works. So I want everyone on the line to know that I want to help them. And if you're my MS patient and you come to me and say, Aaron, I need help quitting, that is exactly what we're going to do. And if you are cared for by another awesome MS doctor out there and you are thinking about quitting smoking, I want you to say something. Now, when you're quitting smoking, there's different phases of quitting. There's the pre-contemplative phase, which is a very polite way of saying, no, -uh, I ain't going to quit. Talk to the hand. I'm still smoking. And then there's the contemplative phase where you'll listen to someone talk about quitting while you smoke a cigarette. You're not ready to quit yet. You're just thinking about it. Then there's the active quitting phase when you are physically trying not to smoke cigarettes. And then the hard part comes in, which is the maintenance phase. And I have tricks and tips for each one of those phases. I've made YouTube videos on this topic. Suffice to say, it all starts off with someone identifying, hey, I think I would like to consider not smoking cigarettes. And this is something that you can take to your doctor. I'll tell you a secret. If you call your doctor and say, hey, doc, I think I would like to quit smoking, you just made her day. It's probably the most exciting thing that she hears across the entire month. So if you're thinking about that and if you want some help, I, I want you to reach out. Now, before we leave the topic of quitting smoking, I want to teach you one pro tip to help you towards quitting smoking. All right. This is a pro tip that I've recommended to a lot of my own patients. I find it to be extremely helpful. And so I'm excited to share it with you right now. Every smoker has three key cigarettes. There's at least three cigarettes that they will smoke. And if you try to interfere, they may murder you. I mean, these are really, really emotionally important cigarettes. Most commonly, it's the cigarette when I wake up in the morning. It's the cigarette when I get home from work. And there may be a cigarette like after dinner or before bed. But what I want you to do is I want you to identify the most important cigarette. So pick that important cigarette. And for the sake of our discussion today, let's say that it's, I wake up in the morning and I'm gonna smoke a cigarette with my coffee. And if you talk to me before I do it, I may kill you, all right? Use that key, key cigarette. And the reason that that's a key cigarette is actually two reasons. Number one, it's a nicotine delivery device. Number two, it is an emotional cigarette. It is the way that you formally start your day. It has emotional value and that makes it dangerous. Because all too often, we quit the easy cigarettes, the cigarette that you have when you're driving your car and you just throw it out the window and don't care about it. Um, other cigarettes drop by the wayside and you may whittle it down from 20 to 10 to two, but you've touched on those key cigarettes, those emotionally charged cigarettes, just like I was talking a second ago um, about this morning cigarette. So here's what I want you to do. Don't quit yet, says the doctor to the smoker. But instead, in the morning, pull out your key cigarette, that really important cigarette. I want you to look at it. I want you to smell it. Ah. And then I want you to set it on the table and smoke it in one hour. Why? Because I need to decouple the nicotine delivery device from the emotional value of the cigarette. And if you can decouple it by identifying it and then making yourself wait an hour, later when you go to quit, you don't have an emotional cigarette in the morning. That's just another cigarette and it's really easy to get rid of. So try that out. The very first of being five for five in your fight against MS is to not smoke stuff. And if you wanna kick it up a notch to consider other cardiovascular risk factors, that's number one. Number two is to exercise as part of your lifestyle. Now, this is as important as taking a disease modifying therapy. Exercising as part of your lifestyle has as big of an impact, in my opinion, as some of the disease-modifying therapies. And exercise is near magical in the setting of MS. Allow me to explain. If you look at a group of people with MS who exercise, as compared to a group of people without exercise, what you'll find is, towards the end of their lives, the exercisers are way less disabled than the folks that weren't exercising. Exercise improves brain volume. It actually allows you to maintain your brain volume longer. Now, 
People impacted by MS are at risk of accelerated brain volume loss. Their brain can shrink upwards of 10 times faster than normal. And exercising as part of your lifestyle is a key way of maintaining that phenomenon, of maintaining that uh, brain volume. And so that's really, really important. Exercise improves sleep quality and helps you consolidate sleep. And so exercise in actuality decreases MS fatigue. Very, very important. Um, Christy Taylor writes, does exercise help PPMS? 100% it does, Christy. And I'm gonna tell you a story real quick. I wanna tell you a story about my old math teacher. When I was in high school, I had an amazing math teacher. And years and years later, he became my MS patient. He had primary progressive MS. And he had primary progressive MS, Christy, in an era where there were no therapies. So there was no treatments. Now, my math teacher was really tall, like 6'8". I mean, he was a real, real tall guy. And he was becoming weaker. And he went from a cane to a walker. And it was getting to the point where he wasn't able to use the walker longer distances. And he was starting to use his wheelchair more and more. And he and his family were concerned that soon he would not be able to walk. And so in the app, and this occurred in the absence of treatments. So we can constructed an exercise program for him. We went to the YMCA where he put on a life jacket and he took his walker in the pool with the life jacket at the YMCA. And he walked with a walker, with a life jacket, and he did laps in the pool. And he did that for three months. Then he came back to see me and my MA came and got me and said, hey, Dr. B, uh, your patient refuses to do the timed 25 foot walk until you watch him in the hallway. So I come out in the hallway and there is my former math teacher standing up tall, holding onto his walker. And he says, young man, are you ready? And I said, yes. And he picked up the walker and he walked 25 feet unassisted. Now that was done not by some magical medicine. That's not some airy fairy story that I read in a textbook somewhere. That was my former math teacher who has PPMS, Tristy, just like you. And he was able to maintain his walking. He actually improved his ability to ambulate for years and years to come just because of his commitment to exercise. So Christy, yes, you absolutely can exercise in the setting of PPMS. Now we're talking about the importance of exercise. And I shared with you that it can slow disability progression in a big way. I shared with you that it can improve brain volume it can improve energy. The number one symptom in MS is fatigue and exercise improves that. And so I certainly think that's important. It also protects you against a future attack. And I want you to think about this with me. Imagine that we took you and we cloned you. So now there's two of you and we'd have to get permission from your spouse and there's probably a lot of legal documentation, but nonetheless, now there's two of you, all right? Clone A and clone B. Now we're going to give clone A chocolate cake and days of our lives TV. And once we have that set up, we're going to turn to clone B and we're going to give clone B an elliptical and carrots, All right? And then the chocolate cake clone is going to watch TV and eat chocolate cake for the next three years. And the elliptical carrots guy or gal is going to be huffing it and eating carrots. Now we get back together three years later, clone A is deconditioned. They've put on some extra pounds. They have a weak core. Their cardiovascular endurance is not awesome. Their balance is not awesome, but they love chocolate cake and they're an aficionado of daytime television. Now clone B is in ship shape, all right? We got a Greek goddess, lost some pounds, strong core, good cardiovascular endurance, strong legs. And then I'm gonna get out a Harry Potter magic wand that I keep in my pocket and I'm gonna cast a spell to cause an attack of left leg weakness. Now, both clone A and clone B have an MS attack of left leg weakness. Clone A, who has been uh, doing the elliptical and staying in shape, is limping. Clone B, who has been watching TV, is seated in a wheelchair and can't stand up. And I'm not gonna insult anyone on the phone right now by asking you which one you wanna be. It's a rhetorical question. What I would rather do is point out that in one person, we allowed them to become deconditioned. We let them get out of shape. In the other patient, we prehabilitated them through exercise. And I want you to keep that in mind. So when you're feeling right as rain, when things are going well, I want you to exercise as part of your lifestyle so that if there's a time where there's weakness or if there's a time when there's an attack, you weather it much, much better. 
Now let's talk a little bit about exercise because many of us are um, not familiar with adult forms of exercise. Many of us remember the heyday of high school or maybe college when we had boundless energy. And if we could run one mile, we could certainly run two. And if you can run two, I could run four. And if it gets too hard or if we stop, then we just quit and we do something different. We have this high school mentality and that mentality does not carry us very far in the setting of exercising with multiple sclerosis. So we have to get rid of the high school mentality when we're gonna exercise. And when I say it's part of your lifestyle, I wanna explain what I mean. I have a lifestyle of brushing my teeth. It's true, I don't talk about it. I guess I'm talking about it now, but I don't brag about it. I don't go, people say, hi, my name's Aaron. I like to brush my teeth a lot. I just brush my teeth in the morning and then I brush my teeth before I go to bed. It's just something that I do. Now let's pretend that one day I forget to brush my teeth in the morning. And I kind of have a yuck mouth. I, when I realize it, I'll go brush my teeth. Now I don't penalize myself or I have to sit in the naughty corner or call my mom and admit to her that I didn't brush my teeth. I just do it. It's just part of my lifestyle. That's the way we need to make exercise for people impacted by MS. Number one, there's no particular exercise that has been proven to be better than another. So it's not like everybody has to be doing X or Y. And in fact, I want you to do the form of exercise that you don't hate, right? Because if you pick a form of exercise that you don't like, you're not gonna do it for very long. So if you enjoy walking, walk. If you're fortunate enough to have tantric sex, God bless. If you enjoy doing yoga or Pilates, that's fantastic. I want you to do a form of exercise that you don't think is stinky, all right? Now, in the spirit of uh, living our best life despite having MS and committing to exercise, I wanna share with you a pro tip. So here's my pro tip for exercise. Actually, I'll, I'll give you two. My first pro tip is water is magic. People impacted by MS thrive in water, and I'll explain. When you're in the water, if you have a weak leg, so weak that it's hard to walk on land, well, in water, you weigh less. So you can ambulate and walk in water when you can't on land. If you are very heat sensitive, and when you get overheated, it can't do very well. Well, the water by convection wicks the heat away from your body. If you have poor balance and tend to fall to the left, the water pushes back to the right. And spasticity diminishes in water compared to on land. So you can do things in the water that you can't necessarily do out of the water and you can have a fantastic time exercising. Now it doesn't have to be swimming, it can be water Zumba. You can do what my, uh, what my uh, math teacher did and you can go in the pool and you can walk in the pool. But one of the pro tips is water is amazing. And so I just want you to think about that when you're trying to plan out an activity. My second pro tip has to deal with um, having equipment at your house. Many, many red-blooded Americans have a spare bedroom upstairs in the back hallway, or they have an extra office in the basement. And in that room is a piece of equipment that is holding a bunch of clothes. So there's an elliptical or a treadmill or some type of gym equipment, and you have hangers on it and you hang all your clothes on it. And it's not really used for exercise. So here's what I want you to do. Take all the clothes off of it, take it out of the back bedroom and drag that elliptical all the way into your living room. I need you to put that piece of equipment in the room where you spend the evening between the hours of 8 p.m. and midnight, all right? When you're decompressing after the workday, after you've done with dinner, after the kid's homework is done, where do you sit? So a lot of red blood Americans, that's in the living room. And that's where I need you to put the elliptical. So now you've got this very ugly piece of gym equipment that Aaron talked you into dragging into your living room and you're sitting there with your spouse and you're trying to relax and you're watching the boob tube, looking at the TV and periodically you're going to look over and you're going to see the elliptical. And then you're going to keep watching the TV and you're going to look over and you're going to see the elliptical. Then something magic happens. I want you to get on it during a commercial. All right. So if you still watch cable TV and if there's still commercials every 15 or 30 minutes, when the commercial comes on, get up, get on the elliptical and just walk until the commercial's over, then sit back down. If you're a Netflix kind of guy and you don't have commercials, God bless you, then at the top and the bottom of every hour, I want you to get on the elliptical for five minutes or three minutes, not for very long. Here's the thing. If you watch two hours of television, 
you may get 30 minutes of intermittent walking while you're sitting there doing nothing. You can do it in your nightgown. In fact, you can even tell your spouse, look, the first commercial, I'll go on it. The second commercial, you go on it. And you can sneak in a little bit of exercise. It works very, very well. Now, before I leave the topic of exercise as being one of the five things that I want you to do to live your best life despite having MS, I want to specifically talk about types of exercise. Remember how I said a little bit ago, do whatever you don't hate? I still mean that. But if you're trying to figure out the options for exercise, there are four elements that we really ideally want. One is cardiovascular endurance. So for some people that's running, for some people that's walking, for some people that's um, boxing, for some people that's skipping rope, for some people that's a stationary bicycle or a recumbent bike. Cardiovascular endurance is one of the things that we need to do. The second thing we need to do is strengthen our core. And so that's Pilates, that's yoga, that's weightlifting, that's calisthenics, that's doing push-ups and sit-ups and pull-ups. Strengthening the core is very, very important. The third thing that we need to think about in exercise is flexibility, right? So stretching, stretching your hamstrings, stretching your butt, stretching your back, stretching your calves, stretching your quads. All of these things are very, very important, not just to help with spasticity, but to help with physical fitness in general. And lastly is balance. And so we need to work on balance and there's a lot of different ways to do that. So I just want to, 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 to share that with you. And I have one last comment as we talk about exercising as part of your lifestyle. There was a study done several years ago that looked at the amount that people with MS moved compared to the amount that people without MS moved. And what they found was people impacted by MS move less often than people without MS. And the biggest day with no movement is on Sunday. So what they found was during the work week, people moved about the same. And on Saturday, they moved about the same. But on Sunday, at least in this group that they were studying, people with MS didn't move very much. So I want you to personally change that statistic by going for a walk or doing something physical on Sunday. All right, so, so far we've talked about two of the five things that we need to do to live our best life despite having MS. Number one, don't smoke stuff. Number two, exercise is part of your lifestyle. Number three, supplement low levels of vitamin D. So when I went to med school, we were taught that vitamin D was this uh, fat soluble vitamin and uh, it helped with bone health. And that's all we were taught because that's all we knew at the time. We now know that vitamin D is a very, very complex molecule. It works like a neurotransmitter. It works like a hormone. It actually has major, major implications in the setting of MS. If your vitamin D level is low pre-puberty, it increases the risk to develop MS. Let me say that again. If you have a low level of vitamin D before you start puberty, it increases the risk that you develop MS. And if you have MS already, low levels of vitamin D drive the disease faster. It turns out that supplementing vitamin D, driving the level up above 50, but below 100 is the jam. We want your level of vitamin D to be above 50. And so I check a vitamin D uh, 25 OH, that's the lab in my patients. I like to do it twice a year. Sometimes I just do it once a year in the winter because that's when it really matters. And I want that number to be above 50. And if it's not, I supplement their vitamin D. Now, one way to get vitamin D is to sit out in the sun and bronze like a, like a tan god. Now, there's problems with that. For example, I live in Ohio where there's no sun half the year. And there's problems with that because of cancer risk and whatnot. Now, there's actually some data that direct sunlight is really good for MS, even without uh, vitamin D. But the reality is that most of us are not gonna get our vitamin D only from the sun. And so in Ohio, I recommend we take a pill. You can supplement with vitamin D3. Vitamin D3 is better absorbed in the human body. And if you're wondering, well, what dose should I take? Um, I can't give you that medical advice. In fact, I can't even see or hear you right now. I'm just talking into my computer. <laughs> um, but I want you to talk to your, your neurologist about the right dose. I oftentimes put people on maintenance as high as four or 5,000 international units daily as I check their levels. Sometimes we have to give them 50,000 units weekly. The point is we wanna drive the vitamin D up. We want it above 50, less than 100. 
And in the spirit of today's lecture, I'm going to take that concept a step further, and I'm going to talk about diet in MS, because diet in MS is very, very important. And the most important thing in diet, I believe, is vitamin D, but there's a bunch of other stuff that we really need to pay attention to. So we could talk about diet in MS for like years and years. It's actually a really large topic, and there's been a lot of research, and there's a lot that we still don't know. But here are some things that we know. I want you to eat real food. That's my challenge, is that you eat real food. Real food is not soda. That's not actually food. It's just a bunch of chemicals in a can. Real food is not fast food. Many of you are aware that if you buy a, a, a cheeseburger from your local fast food joint and you leave it sitting out for three years and look at it, it still looks like a cheeseburger. That's not real food, guys. That's fake food. That's something uh, full of chemicals. I don't want you to eat fast food. I don't want you to eat heavily processed foods. Um, so like microwave frozen pizzas are not pizza. It's a bunch of bunch of other things that you don't want. I don't want you to eat sugar laden foods or uh, heavily fried foods. And if foods have ingredients that you can't pronounce, I don't want you to eat it like literally. So you should eat foods that have ingredients like apple, asparagus, broccoli, pear, chicken, things like that. So if, if you have food that has ingredients like poly, saca, something, soup, soup, something, that's not a food. And so when you ask me about diet, the very first thing we're going to talk about is supplementing vitamin D. But if you then want to take it a step further and you want to start to live your very best life despite having MS, and you're thinking about augmenting your lifestyle by improving your diet, my first challenge to you is try eating real food. And you'll find that in America, it's actually rather challenging to eat real food. You have to food prep, you have to plan. There's a lot that goes into eating real food. Beyond eating real food, I really want you to up your water game. So water is very, very important. And drinking water is very, very important. And many red-blooded Americans are completely dehydrated all day long. They're not really drinking water. And if you want to live your best life despite having MS, you can do that in part by supplementing your water. So I want you to drink a glass of water with each of your three meals. So you have breakfast and you have some orange juice and you have coffee and you have your eggs and your bacon and blah, blah. Have a glass of water, crush a glass of water with breakfast. That's not too hard. Same thing during your lunch, have a glass of water. During dinner, one glass of water. Now, all we need to do beyond a glass with each meal is drink one glass of water between each meal. So you finish breakfast, you got four hours in front of you until it's lunchtime. Can you drink one glass of water? The answer is yes, you can. And so I want you to drink a glass of water between breakfast and lunch and between lunch and dinner. And if you do that, you are well, well on your way towards upping your water game. Now, what will you find? You'll actually find you have less urinary tract infections. Your bladder works better, not worse. You're less constipated. You have less spasticity and less neuropathic pain and you have more energy. And if you don't believe me, try it and you'll be shocked at what you find. So upping your water game is very, very important. Now, there are no proven diets that slow multiple sclerosis. There are no diets that have been proven to slow multiple sclerosis. Now, there are a lot of diets out there and I'm not saying that they're not helpful or good. I'm simply saying that they have not been proven to slow MS. And if you wanted to look at an out of the box diet, my fave, my fave is overcoming MS. I think that the overcoming MS diet has the most science and I think that it's the most reasonable. And so if you did want to study an MS diet, that's one that I personally would recommend. So there's a lot more that we could say about diet, but I really want us to be thinking about the importance of supplementing vitamin D upping your water game and eating real food. And if you're looking for an out-of-the-box diet or you just want to learn more, I would totally encourage you to consider uh, reading about the Overcoming MS Diet for what that's worth. Now, we're talking about being five for five in your fight against MS. And so far, we've talked about number one, don't smoke stuff. Number two, exercise is part of your lifestyle. Number three, supplement vitamin D. And now we move on to number four. Number four, is take an MS medicine and make sure it's working. And I'm talking about disease modifying therapies. So 
I feel that taking an MS medicine is as important as a diabetic taking insulin. And if you want to live your best life despite having MS, if you want to stave off neurological disability, if you want to be able to be there as a father, as a mother, as a, as a family member, as a, um, a, a, an employee, as a member of society, I think that we have to take an MS medicine in order to pull that off. And in 1993, there was one medicine available to treat MS. Today, in 2021, there are 25 different formulations of MS medicines to treat MS, which is freaking awesome. That's fantastic. And in my 16 years of being an MS doctor, I've failed zero times getting someone on a medicine. Allow me to repeat. I've never failed in getting someone on a medicine unless they don't want to be on a medicine. So I have patients in my clinic that aren't on a drug because they won't take a drug. But I have yet to fail finding something that someone can tolerate. Now, going back to being five for five, I said, I want you to take an MS medicine and I want you to make sure it's working. And the focus of this is really on the second part of that sentence make sure it's working. So if you're on oral birth control and you get pregnant, it didn't work, right? Because the goal of oral birth control is to not get pregnant, to, to avoid an unplanned pregnancy. So if you're taking an MS medicine, what are the goals of the MS medicine? Well, I think the goal should be no attacks. I think the goal should be no new spots on MRI. I think the goal should be your neuro exam doesn't change. I think the goal should be your brain volume should uh, shrink at a normal, healthy rate. Those are, that's my opinion about what we should get out of a disease-modifying therapy. And if you're on a DMT and you have an attack, it didn't work. Now, does that mean that you are required to change medicines? I don't know, but I think it should be a discussion. If you're on a DMT and you have an attack, you need to talk to your neurologist about whether or not it's a good idea to stay on that medicine because it just failed you. If you are on an MS medicine and you have a new spot on your MRI, that's not okay with me. That's the equivalent of an attack. And we have to ask the neurologist a question, should I still stay on this medicine? If you have worsening of your neurological exam on a medicine, I'm not okay with that. And I think we have to ask ourselves the question, should we change medicines? Now, I'm not saying that each time this occurs that you change, I'm saying that it's a discussion. I want you to fight against something called therapeutic inertia. Therapeutic inertia is where we identify that something's not okay and that we need to make a change, and yet we don't. So if you have high blood pressure and you're on a blood pressure medicine and your doctor doesn't adjust the blood pressure medicine, and so you still have high blood pressure, that's not okay. That's therapeutic inertia. And in MS, we see therapeutic inertia all the time, guys, all the time. So if you're on a DMT, if you're on an MS medicine and you have a new spot on your MRI, don't let the neurologist just gloss over that. Say, wait a second, doesn't that mean I have breakthrough disease? Shouldn't we at least talk about whether I need to be on something different? And if together as a team, you discuss it and decide to stay on drug, okay. But at least you have the conversation and you can put the drug on warning. And I certainly wouldn't let it do that twice. So when I say you need to take an MS medicine and you need to make sure it's working, that's really what I'm talking about is testing the medicine to make sure it's working. I think a best practice is to have an MRI of your brain once a year. And if you see new spots on that, that's not okay. I think a best practice is to be seen in clinic where you can be examined or on telemedicine in some fashion where you can be examined at least once a year, if not several times a year. And I think that we need to listen to you when you talk to us about whether or not you're failing the litmus test of life and whether you're having attacks. And if things aren't going okay, we need to ask ourselves the question, is this medicine okay or do I need an upgrade? Is there something else that I need to change? So when we talk about being five for five in your fight against MS, the first four are don't smoke. The second one is to exercise as part of your lifestyle. The third one is to supplement vitamin D. And the fourth one is to take a DMT. And that comprises my initial four for four comment. And for a long time, and still to this day, I talk a lot about being four for four, but I forgot one really important element. And that's what I'm gonna talk about now. I have a really good friend who is a psychologist par excellence. Her name is Amy Sullivan. Uh, she is a PhD psychologist. 
um, at this small MS center called the Mellon Center at the Cleveland Clinic. And she's in charge of behavioral health up there. And she does an awesome job. And one day I was talking to her about being four for four. And she said, Boster, you forgot one. It really needs to be five for five. And what she reminded me that if we're going to live our best life, if despite having MS, in addition to not smoking and exercising, in addition to eating healthy and supplementing vitamin D, and in addition to taking a disease modifying therapy, we need one more thing. We need to introduce mindfulness into our lives. Mindfulness, you say, what's that? Well, good question. Mindfulness is something that Americans don't do very often. It's a, a moment uh, of reflection where you focus on the now in a way to help minimize and manage stress. So if you're not familiar with mindfulness, when you're done with this chit chat, look it up on the interwebs and read a little bit about it or watch a couple of videos on it. But really the act of being mindful is something that every single person can do almost at any time if they practice. And today I'm gonna to teach you one way to be mindful during meals. And so it's called mindful eating or mindful meals. Now, let's be honest. Very often, we don't sit at a table with our family. We may eat a cheeseburger while driving 70 miles an hour and talking on the cell phone, kind of, you know, and, and that's our dinner. Or we may grab something out of the fridge and plop down on the couch and watch TV and return some emails with one hand while we eat a snack with the other, right? And that is about as far away from being mindful as possible. And so if we were to introduce mindfulness to eating, here's what we would do. Number one, we would tell the family that we're going to be really focusing on dinner tonight. And there's no screens during dinner. There's no phones at the dinner table. There's no TV on in the other room. We're not even going to listen to a podcast or the radio. We turn all that off. And we sit at the table together as a unit, we sit down at the table and the food is on the table. And what I want you to do is I want you to think about what you're eating. I want you to look at it, really look at it. Look at the colors, like call it out, be like green, red, brown. I want you to smell it. I want you to smell the food. I want you to comment on the way it smells. I want you to look at the people that are around you and appreciate the fact that you're all together. And then I want you to eat and I want you to focus on eating. I want you to try to taste the food. Don't just shove it in your mouth and jump up to your next activity. Take five minutes out of your life and really, really taste what you're eating. Live in the present moment. Don't tell yourself movies in your mind about something that happened that was bad the other day. Don't tell yourself movies in your mind about what might happen moving forward, about something scary in the future. Spend five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, just living in the now eating your meal. And what you will find is that that activity is revolutionary and it's energizing. Mindfulness is a form of stress management, which is life-changing. And it's something that can help us in all walks of life at all kinds of different times. Now, I'm not gonna do a, a justice. I am not a mindfulness master. I am still a novice learning about mindfulness. But increasingly, I feel that it's a missing element out of our lives in the setting of MS. And that in order to live our very best life despite having MS, we need to put some attention towards the concepts of stress management and mindfulness. And that is my five for five and my fight against MS. That's what I want you to do to live your best life despite having MS. I want you to not smoke. I want you to supplement uh, your vitamin D. I want you to exercise as part of your lifestyle. I want you to take an MS medicine and make sure it's working. And number five, I want you to incorporate on a daily basis, some form of stress management. Now, Chris, I'm gonna pass the mic back to you and we can open this up for questions. Thank you everyone for your attention. All right, thank you, Dr. Boster, um, so much. We love having you uh, having you on. You're, you, uh, you're so energetic. You're like, uh, I mean, a, a doctor that's also a motivational speaker is, is uh, really, uh, what MS folks, um, you know, what we really like and, and, and what uh, folks really need. Speaking of um, uh, motivation, we, we have a question from Joe, and he wants some tips and tricks to improve exercise discipline. I know you mentioned earlier about putting, uh, you know, things in the living room or, uh, or what have you, but the discipline of actually doing um, so, so Joe, one way that we can reinforce discipline is to find accountability. 
And one great way to find accountability is to be accountable to people that you love. So you could ask your, you could ask your spouse, can I be accountable to you? Can you hold me? I want to exercise three times a week. And I'm asking you as my spouse, um, I'm going to commit to you that I'm going to do that. And I want you to throw it back in my face if I don't. So if I tell you that I'm going to exercise three times a week and you happen to notice that I'm not, I'm asking you to say, honey, didn't you want to be exercising? Don't you, don't you want that? And so accountability is a really helpful thing. Something that makes accountability better tolerated is if your loved one does it with you. So now your spouse is exercising and you're exercising and you hold each other accountable. And again, we're not trying to set world records for uh, the fastest jog or the highest mountain. You might be walking to your mailbox and back, but if that's your form of exercise, I want you to celebrate when you do it. And I want your spouse to celebrate with you. And I want you to hold each other accountable. And that's yet another way that we can help reinforce the importance of exercise. Great question, Joe. Thank you. And if I might add to that, adding mindfulness to the exercise can be extremely yeah. helpful. Absolutely. You know, so instead of listening to a podcast or the radio, try really focusing on what you're doing. Focus on your breathing. Focus on the lifting of the weights or focus on your heart rate or, you know, really spend some time in the activity is exercise. Really think about what you're doing and be in that moment as opposed to having earbuds in and being somewhere else. Excellent point, Chris. Thank you. And also maybe self-talk. Maybe you could talk about that for a second while you're doing the exercise, just like with eating, the self-talk that's going on is yeah. might be important. All of these things are ways of helping you be more aware of the moment and really getting more out of the moment. Um, oftentimes you may find that you lift more weights when you do that, or you can go a little farther. Um, so very, very good points, Chris. Thank you for kicking that up a notch. Yeah. Ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we have some questions from the internet, and uh, one of them is a comment on changing up a DMT for proactive reasons, uh, not triggered by a relapse or MRI change, but just to be on a better drug. Um, it feels scary, It's um, but it's a longer-term decision. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, and what so is your perspective? Anne has asked this question. Um, you know, in, as I was mentioning, in 2021, we have all these different medicines. And Anne's question, she gives an example of um, fingolimod, which is code name for gelinia and ochromis. All right, so she's using an example. And, and let's use this, this example today. Fingolimod gelinia is a great medicine. It's a pill that came out in 2011 or 2010, October. And it's, it's a pill that you take once a day. And at the time it came out, it was really the, one of the best things that we had available. Now, if you fast forward uh, 10 years, we now have other therapies that seem to be more effective in groups of people. Now, now you, and you're not a groups of people, you're one human, right? So, but nonetheless, there are things that in this example, Ocrevus may bring to the table. For example, maybe Ocrevus does a better job at slowing disability progression or maybe it would appear that Ocrevus does a better job of confirmed disability improvement or what have you. Is it fair to discuss an upgrade? Yes, it is fair, all right? Think about it this way, if you would. You have one brain, it's yours. It's the only one you'll ever have. You can't transplant it. And you have one life, the one you're living in right now, and you can't redo it. And so if you have good, you're not required to settle. You're allowed to ask for great. And if you want more out of your therapy, there's now options to do that. I'll give you another example. I have right here in front of me an iPhone 11, all right? This thing is like a mini uh, computer. I mean, this can I can do uh, video chat with it. I can do advanced algebra with it. I can surf the interwebs with it. If you think back to the very, very first cell phone, all right, that block gray thing that we would plug into the charger all night and had a hard antenna, that cell phone still works, but nobody uses it because we have advances in cell phone technology and the newer phones can do more things. So is it fair to ask for more? Yes, it's fair. Now, does that mean that everyone on Jelenia should go on Ocrevus? No, it does not. But is it fair to ask whether we can get more out of a drug? It is fair. And that's a conversation that I would welcome in clinic, 100%. Thank you for asking it. 
All right. We have um, another question from, uh, and it addresses aging and MS. When organizations talk about the lifespan of someone with MS, it's very upsetting and daunting, but no one talks about the other, uh, other than a number. Um, does, do you have any thoughts about patients uh, in their 60s and beyond? Yes, Kathy, I do. So, so we first have to think about where that data comes from, right? So the data that says that people impacted by MS die early predates an era of therapy, right? So it's true that if you look at untreated MS, the average age of death is about seven years earlier than the general population. And when you take disease modifying therapies, you extend that. And so the very first MS medicine that ever came out was called beta seron, came out in 1993. And the beta seron trials followed patients ever since those initial trials. And very recently, they published 20 year long term follow up data. And they looked at patients that started beta seron initially, and then a group of patients that started later. And one of the things they found was really scary, but true, is that the patients that started beta seron sooner lived longer. It extended their life. So when we talk about dying early, I really think that's, that's uh, an era that predates therapy. That's the first thing, right? The second thing is we can do more to address MS than ever before. And it doesn't stop when you hit the age of 50 or 60 or 70 for that matter. And so I understand that it can be very, very unsettling, but I want to reassure you that in the modern era, if we are exercising as part of our lifestyle, if we're not smoking things, if we are supplementing vitamin D and paying attention to what we eat, and if we're making sure that the DMT is working, I think that our expectations for quality of life and for life expectancy are very different than what was reported in the past. Thanks for asking that question, Kathy. I think you're on uh, mute, Chris. Still on mute. Ah, we have a mouse issue. So I'm I'm just going to go ahead and read another one of these questions um, while, while Chris is fighting with an electronic mouse. Um, and so uh, let's see. Anne writes, could Dr. B comment on changing up a DMT? We got that question. And then... Um, Anne also writes about referring to mindfulness, really uh, recommend full catastrophe, catastrophic living. Um, and then she gives a reference and that's a US mindfulness expert. So, so Anne, thank you very much for bringing that up. Um, and if somebody else would really enjoy learning about it, maybe that's a great resource. Now, Michael writes, um, could Dr. Boster talk about the advantages and disadvantages of me being treated with stem cells in research? All right, so, so stem cell transplantation is a very hot topic in MS. And stem cell transplantation is not a, 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 a therapy or like a medicine, it's a procedure. And so let me just explain to you briefly about um, how you do the, the procedure. First, we harvest stem cells from your body and we put them on ice. Second, we murder you. We give you lethal doses of chemotherapy and radiation, or just one of the two. And we ablate your immune system. So we remove your immune response. You have no bone marrow. Then before you die, we give you back your, your pluripotent stem cells and pray they take. And then there's a period where you really don't have an immune response for a while. And we, we try to get you past that scary period. Now, stem cell transplantation has come a long way in the last 20 years, and it's been a long time since there's been a death from stem cell transplantation, so that's good news. But stem cell transplants are not prime time yet. They are not prime time, and I do not recommend doing a stem cell transplant for MS outside of a clinical trial. Now, the reason I bring that up to you is there's a major concern on the table internationally, and that's stem cell tourism where you can travel to an exotic location like India or Mexico or Chicago and pay someone like twenty dollars to $50,000 and they'll swap out your bone marrow. But I do not recommend that because it's not controlled and we don't know the quality of what they're doing and we don't know the follow-up. And I could tell you some really scary stories. So stem cell transplantation is something that's very, very exciting. I do think that it, that it will 
hold a place at the table for MS therapeutics, but it's not prime time just yet. And I would not recommend that someone has a stem cell transplant outside of uh, research, at least today. Thank you for that question. So Andrew, or I'm sorry, Michael also writes, how many times should I exercise in a seven day week? And my answer is it depends. So the way that I want you to think about exercise or whether or not you overdid it is by what happens the next day. So if you can do your workout on Monday and Tuesday is a normal day, you didn't overdo it. But if you have to back away from activities because of motor fatigue or heat sensitivity or just because you overdid it in the gym, then that's not okay. And to make that point, I'll share a quick story about a gentleman that I took care of years ago. He was in his late 70s, I think. And he got a big smile on his face and he said, I can work out in the gym for three hours. And I thought, wow, that's a lot. And then his wife, who was sitting next to him, back of her hand, smacked him on the chest and said, then tell the nice doctor what happens. And then he says kind of meagerly, then I'm in bed for three days. And that was a real story. He really did. He would go to the gym and he would bust hump and he would really have a good time. And then he'd be in bed for days. Well, what we figured out was if he exercised a half an hour every other day, he could do that indefinitely. And then he wouldn't tucker himself out. So there isn't a number of days a week that I would start with. I would work out and then I would see what the next day is like. And I would use the next day as your metric. Thanks for that question. That's really great. Uh, Dr. Boster, we do have some, uh, some questions um, from the internet uh, as well. I mean, from email and Facebook as well. Awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, question is, if there's an MRI that's contradicted, are there any other uh, diagnostic scans that can be done to locate lesions? For example, a PET scan, um, and nothing has been seen on a CT. So it's, if you can't have an MRI, that's tricky. Um, in the modern era, um, we really have become increasingly dependent on MRIs to diagnose MS and to monitor MS. Now, I, I think this question is more about monitoring MS than anything else. It, we don't have an easy surrogate technology. A CT scan, as you point out, is not helpful. An X-ray is not helpful. And a PET scan is unrealistic and it may not be helpful because the temporal resolution of a, of a PET scan leaves a little bit to be desired. Um, and so it, it makes for a very challenging time. Now, I want to challenge what contraindicated MRI means because it's very rare that someone can't actually have an MRI. Um, the most common is that they have a pacemaker, which is not MRI compatible. And it is reasonable to talk to when they replace your pacemaker to replace it with an MRI compatible tool. Spinal cord stimulators are now made to be MRI compatible and um, bladder stimulators are made to be MRI compatible. So I just wanna challenge when you say MRI is not an option, exactly what we mean by that. That was a really great question. Thank you for asking it. All right, we have um, another question from Sue. Uh, from Facebook, advice on managing heat intolerance. So Sue, I have um, a playlist on my YouTube channel about temperature sensitive um, symptoms in MS. And I probably have like 15 some videos. It's a really important topic. And I really appreciate you asking that question. So let's talk about five ways that we can deal with temperature uh, intolerance or heat intolerance in specific. The first one is paying attention to when we exercise. So exercising outside in the middle of the day in August in Ohio is, is a recipe for sweating your butt off and for being in 90 to 100 degree temperature. And if you're heat sensitive, it's a really bad time to exercise. So instead, you could exercise first thing in the morning before the sun comes up, or you could wait until after 8 p.m. and you could exercise in the evenings. And by doing that, you're avoiding the, the peak heat time. A second option is to do a water-based activity. Because as I mentioned, if you're in a swimming pool, the pool pulls heat away from your body. A third option is to wear a cooling vest. Many of my patients bring a cooling vest to the gym or to the track field, and they wear a cooling vest, which keeps them cool. A fifth option is to look into taking the medicine, or fourth option, excuse me, look into the medicine Ampira for aminopurity. And Impira is a prescription that you need to get from your doctor and you need to make sure that it's safe for you. But in a third and a half of patients that take it, it buttresses them against heat sensitivity. 
Now, uh, a fifth option, if you don't have a cooling vest, is you can get cooling implements, like a cooling kerchief, a cooling hat, and you can drink ice water while exercising to cool your body from the inside. All of these things can help. Great question. Okay, uh, let's see. There is, uh, I have, um, this is from Claudia. I have uh, SPMS. Um, how can one know if a DMT is even working? Uh, no more flare-ups, no active MS lesions. What are the DMTs to use? Uh, I'm currently on Mazent. It's, uh, it's like trying to prove a negative. Sure. So, so what I heard is this person has primary progressive MS. And so in the United States, there's one FDA approved therapy for primary progressive MS, and it's not Mazent. Mazent has I'm, never been. Uh, yeah. Just to it's uh, secondary progressive. I oh, believe. okay. Thank you. So um, I apologize. I heard incorrectly. So, so how do you measure progression or what are the goals of therapy? Well, the easiest way to figure it out is to clone the human and give one of them the medicine and one of them a hug. And then in five years, it'll be really clear whether the medicine worked. The problem is that it's not capable to clone people and your spouse might not let us clone you. You might not want to do that. So instead, here's what we do. We do a clinical trial where we enroll patients with MS who should be like you. And then we test that exact experiment where we give half of them the drug and half of them placebo, or we give half of them the drug and half of them a less effective drug or what have you. And then we see if we can see a difference, right? And so if we can demonstrate that in a group of people with MS like you, that there's a benefit, then we extrapolate that benefit to you, right? And, and that's one of the ways that we can uh, try to apply a therapy. The reality is that the natural history of MS which is a doctor's way of saying, if you don't do anything, what happens over time is you get worse. And so if taking a medicine slows that down, you'll still get worse. You'll just do it slower than you would have. And that's where a lot of like frustration and unknown comes in, which is why it's so important to set realistic expectations and to talk about the, the, the medicines with your provider so that you know the realistic expectations. We oftentimes will look at something called the MS severity score, right? MSSS, the multiple sclerosis severity score. So you can do an image search on Google and you'll find it for free. Or you can type in PDDS, patient determined disease step. And what you'll see is a pretty graph which shows you years of MS on the uh, going down one, the column in your exam across the top. And it's done with that EDSS. And, and we can see how you fare compared to other people. And that's the natural history. Now, the reason I'm bringing this graph up to you is over time, people stay on their color and they get worse over time. And if we can hold you perfectly still, or if you only get a little worse, we're actually beating the disease. And so that's something that you can sit down with your MS neurologist. They can show you those graphs and they can help you understand. That's a great question. Well, thank you. Now, before we go, I did see a question before it disappears in the list. Um, somebody said, what is that painting behind you? Yes, that was so, Judy. Judy. Yeah, Judy writes, excellent, very relevant lecture. Judy, thank you. Um, one question, what's the picture behind you show? So, so that was drawn by my grandfather, Irv Levy. It was a drawing of my grandmother, Irene Levy. It's a characterized as kind of, um, and he drew that for her years and years ago. Now, my grandparents were both care partners for my uncle Mark, who had MS. And I grew up spending every Shabbos dinner in their house, and I learned firsthand what it meant to care for someone with MS. I learned what it meant to have to help someone go to the bathroom or to transfer or to swallow long before I knew what neuroimmunology was. And the two people that taught me that were that woman in that picture and her husband, my grandparents. So thank you for asking that question. All right. Um, we have a, a good number of other questions as, as well. Um, very relevant to what um, to what we're what we're uh, uh, we're talking about. Um, my PMC uh, doesn't test my vitamin D unless I continue to beg him. Apparently, it's very ex uh, it's a very expensive test, two hundred dollars. Uh, what can I say to get him to do it? And this is from Lisa. So, Lisa, I think that you can share that that there's very good scientific data that low levels of vitamin D make MS worse. 
and worsening MS is way more expensive than $200. So if your disease progresses, God forbid, and you need a new assist device, or if you're not able to work full time, that's way more expensive than a $200 lab test. So I, I appreciate the desire to be uh, um, attentive, but I think that it is mandated that we check your vitamin D. Now, if the doc doesn't wanna do it all the time, say, okay, let's make a deal. I want you to do it once in the dead of winter. That's the most useful time because that's when it's gonna be the lowest. And you can assume that the supplementation that works in the winter is gonna be dandy like candy in the summer. And so those are two arguments that I would make. Make a deal, do it once a year in the, in the winter and tell the doc that untreated or undertreated MS is way more expensive than letting me check my vitamin D level. All right, um, another question from Barbara. It's a bit off topic. Uh, do all MS meds require a washout period or can some overlap or start the new one as soon as you stop the old one? This is what is keeping me from considering a quote upgrade. So I have a YouTube video specifically on washouts where I go through every permutation of washout that you could think of. And it's really outside the scope of this lecture today, but suffice to say that it's very, very individualized. It really depends on what drug A is and what drug B is. Now, generally speaking, I don't do washouts anymore. I try to tighten drugs one next to the other, but there are tricks and tips. And so the proper answer to your question lies when we know which drug you're on right now and which one you're considering going to. And if you wanted to learn more, check out the YouTube uh, video that I made, uh, kind of get into the weeds there. Okay, we have uh, another question from Isa. Uh, how can we determine if symptoms are age-related or MS-related since many are the same? For example, forgetfulness, bladder issues, et cetera. That's a really good point because you don't get a buy from the rest of life just because you have MS. And if you think, man, I'm having bladder problems and you ask your age uh, appropriate friends, they may say, yeah, honey, me too, right? So it makes it really challenging. So instead of trying to figure out if it's age related, I would like to figure out if it impairs your quality of life, right? So if you're having urinary urgency and accidents, I don't really care if it's MS or age related. I just think that you shouldn't have that. And so I wanna treat it. And it may be coming from your MS, but even if it's not coming from your MS and I give you a pill you take once a morning and it makes you control your bladder and not wet yourself, that's good, right? So it, it can be tricky. And, and a very common one is cognition where you may be forgetful um, and you're not sure if it's just old age or not. And I would share with you that most commonly it's not old age. Uh, most commonly when you're having cognitive impairment and that you're aware of, um, it's, it's something that we need to dig into and look at because it's way, way common in MS. But your point's very well taken. And it really speaks to why brain health is so important. Why do I want you to not smoke and pay attention to cardiovascular risk factors? Because that'll make you age faster. It'll make your brain age faster. Why do I want you to supplement vitamin D? And why do I want you to exercise as part of your lifestyle? Because it'll maintain brain volume and, and it'll help you age at a more natural rate. Very excellent question. Thank you. Uh, just a quick side note. How important is hydration? Very, very, very important. Like very important. And so many red-blooded Americans walk around <laughs> dehydrated. It's awful. So if you don't believe me, try drinking a glass of water with each meal and a glass of water between each meal for a week. And then you can call me and tell me what you think. But I, I've challenged many, many people with MS and invariably they're shocked at what a big difference it makes. You lose weight, you have more energy, you sleep better, you poop better. I mean, it's really good stuff. You should drink more water. Okay. Um, Robin asks for your thoughts on medication for fatigue. So fatigue is the most common symptom in MS, and we can't fix fatigue with just a pill, but there are plenty of medicines that are critically important when trying to address fatigue. And I never, ever give people MS fatigue medicines in the absence of other things like behavioral measures, et cetera. But to answer your question, the most commonly used medicines for fatigue that I have success with are modafinil and armodafinil. So that's code name for provigil and nuvigil and Adderall, Ritalin, Focalin, the, um, the amphetamine salts. And so those are controlled substances. They require prescriptions, but they can be life changing. And I'll share with you a story of a patient I take care of who is a lawyer and he's a partner at a firm and they were literally gonna vote him off the island. 
Like, and it was because he couldn't keep thinking and he couldn't stay awake and he was falling asleep and not performing very well. We put him on one of the medicines that I just mentioned, along with some exercise and other maneuvers. He's been working ever since. It's been like six or seven years and he's killing it. Um, and so fatigue medicines are very, very important. Uh, all right. Another question from Facebook from Elizabeth. Uh, if I walk around the block on day one, my foot starts uh, dropping, dropping before I get out of the house instead of being able before I get to the house, I should say, instead of being able to build up endurance over time, each day uh, gets worse. How can she get past this? So the secret to the solution is in the first sentence. If I walk around the block on day one, that's the problem. You're walking all the way around the block on day one. Don't do that. That's too far. So, so if you're walking around the block and you start to have foot drop by the time you're done, don't walk that far. I want you to start by walking a fourth of the block and then come home. Walk fourth of the block, then come home. And when you can consistently do that every day, then you increase to half a block then you can increase the three-fourths of a block. And my point is, I think if you're starting to bite off more than you can chew in the beginning, I want you to back way up and then I slowly want you to build up momentum and you will be successful. I just think we can't start with the whole block. That's too much for the beginning. Okay, Jason uh, asked a question. He was exercising regularly until he also developed BPPB. Uh, Mind paracysmal positional vertigo. Yeah. Uh, are MS patients more susceptible and what can be done to manage stop the occurrence? So BPPV stands for benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. So the word benign means it's not a tumor, like it's not a life-threatening problem. BP stands for paroxysmal, which means it just comes randomly. So um, BPPV just comes and then it'll go away. Positional means that it has to do with the position of your head, and vertigo means you have a hallucination of spinning. So BPPV is the most common cause of vertigo in humans. It doesn't have to do with MS, it's, but it's the most common cause of vertigo in people with MS. And what happens is you turn your head and the little otoliths in your ear get, get bent, except they don't unbend, they get stuck. So your head thinks you're still turning even though you're not and you feel like you're spinning and it makes you puke, it's terrible. And there's actually something called an Epley maneuver. So Epley named this thing after himself. And the Epley maneuver is a physical therapy maneuver that will break BPPV. So you can go to your friendly neighborhood physical therapist, you can go to your friendly neighborhood neurologist or you can just do a YouTube search for Epley maneuver, E-P-L-Y, and you'll see somebody performing the Epley maneuver. You can do it on the side of the bed and stop BPPV. Great question, thank you. I was just getting ready to write that down. Epley maneuver? Epley, E-P-L-Y, Epley maneuver. All right, okay. Um, we do have uh, some uh, a good number of more questions, but uh, Anne, I uh, just wanna say hi to Anne. She uh, said she's in Edinburgh. Uh, and well, uh, stay, well, well worth staying up past midnight in Edinburgh to watch. Uh, so, so thank you, Ann. Uh, Edinburgh is one of my favorite cities uh, in Great Britain. It's, it's, a, it's a colossal city, and I had the pleasure of taking my family there a couple of years ago. Yeah. Um, so we, we were able to, to take the kids to the castle, and it was just to die for. So please say hi to Edinburgh for me. All right. Uh, Kristen, um, do you think it's necessary that stay, uh, do you think, uh, that staying on a DMT at the age 63 is necessary? This is a very, very uh, timely question. And there is a plague which only seems to infect MS neurologists. And it's a, it's a terrible plague of ageism where some MS neurologists get this kooky idea that just because you're a certain age, they can stop your medicine, which I think is reprehensible. I personally do not agree with that at all. So I think that you should stop MS medicine at death because the drugs don't work after death. But as long as you have a nervous system with functions that you like, like seeing, swallowing, orgasming, walking, scratching, if there are things that you like, and if you still have an immune system, even if it's a 63 year old immune system and it's quieting down, it's still at risk of attacking you. And so I don't want to stop your MS medicines. The MS medicines do more than just prevent attacks and, and spots. They also slow disability progression. 
and they slow brain volume loss. And so I do not think that it's a good idea to stop. Now I'll tell you, I've, been, I've taken on many, many patients who have had their MS medicine stopped by other doctors and they get worse. And then they come to me and we put them back on therapy. And so do I think it's necessary if you have MS? Yeah, I do think it's necessary, absolutely. I refuse to be ageist. And 63 is the new 43, that's not old. All right. Um, a couple more questions. One, it, what if someone has a compromised core? Because uh, you mentioned having a strong core, but if it gets compromised from surgery or something like that, what are some things uh, to, to help build up um, the core? So I think one of the best tools that I can offer you is a neurophysical therapist. So physical therapists are wizards. They wear scrubs, but they're wizards. They should wear capes. And a neurophysical therapist goes to school for an extra long time to understand the concepts of motor fatigue, heat sensitivity, ataxia, vertigo, all these neurological things that are so relevant. And so if, if getting in shape is posing a, a problem because um, of problems to your core or what have you, I think a very good way to circumvent that is to work with a neurophysical therapist. They will help you figure out how to take care of the problem. That's my best uh, suggestion for you. All right. Um, from Alan, today there's only one DMT approved for primary progressive MS. Is there anything in the research pipeline for uh, PPMS that you're yes. really excited about? Yeah, very. So there is a, a molecule called BTK inhibitor. And when I told my wife that, she said, ah, bind, torture, kill. Which, and I said, what? so it turns out that there's a serial killer named BTK. So this has nothing to do with serial killers. It's a molecule called BTK, bertine tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And it's a small molecule. It's a pill, which is currently used um, in various treatments for cancer. So it's a small molecule, which is now being tested in MS and it looks like a rock star, all right? This drug, BTK inhibitor, it blocks B cell signaling without murdering B cells. So that's kind of a cool trick. And it turns off activated microglia, which are cells in the brain, part of the innate immune system that we've never been able to reach. And now we can. And we here at the Boston Center for MS are doing one of these trials in primary progressive MS. I'm actually super excited that we have enrolled two primary progressive patients from central Ohio that are participating in the trial. And so that's one area where PPMS research has got me super jazzed. I'm very excited about BTK inhibitors. Yes. Okay, um, uh, Brenda has a question. I have relapsing remitting MS. Am I destined to have secondary progressive MS down the road if I haven't progressed already? How will I know I have progressed? So no, you are not predestined to have to have SPMS. Most people with MS, if they live long enough, will develop some progression. Um, that's true. And the MS medicines, particularly the newer MS medicines, delay onset of secondary progressive MS. And so the, the one thing I want to say is someone with SPMS still has relapsing MS and they're still at risk of having relapses and they still need to be treated because these medicines decrease attacks and they decrease new spots and they slow disability progression. So it's still critically important that you take a DMT, even though you may have some progression of disability. Good question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. And that, I believe, is all the questions we have for tonight, believe it wow. or not. Well, wow. you know, let me wrap up by saying yeah. thank you uh, to this amazing organization. Uh, MS Foundation is, is a superb group of people. I so appreciate the opportunity to come on today and to speak to everyone. So thank you for that. My name is Aaron Boster, uh, and I'm the founder of the Boster Center for MS here in Columbus, Ohio. But you can find me on the interwebs on my YouTube channel at Aaron Boster MD. You can find me on Twitter at uh, Aaron Boster MD and same thing on Facebook. Um, and if you guys uh, want to up your game, you know, come check out the YouTube channel. Um, I, as always, I want to thank you for learning about MS with me and thank you for the provocative questions. It's been a great night and I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their week. Yeah. And, if you want, and, and, and if you want to see some more amazing artwork and so, sort of inside the office, you can go to your website um so because we were asking about the pallets uh what's what's your website oh so you can the, our website is bostermscom so b-o-s-t-e-r-m-s.com and you can check out our research trials on there you can kind of get a, there's a, a virtual tour on there of the center 
um, there's a lot of great stuff. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, it's, it's great because we love the, we were talking about the pallet, uh, pallet yeah, background yeah, earlier. It's my beautiful. office and uh, my, my wife and uh, did all those pallet walls to, to die for. So, yeah, that's thank great. you again. Guys, have a great night. As always, thank you so much for upping your game and learning about MS with me. So until next time, God bless and take care. All right. And uh, if you missed any part of this conference, it will be replayed on msfocusradio.org and available on demand on our MS Focus SoundCloud channel or our YouTube channel. And also make sure to check out Dr. Boster's uh, YouTube channel as well. Join us next Tuesday at 3.30 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time for uh, Returning to Normal. Are you ready? A COVID and MS update with Dr. Ben Brower from the Shepherd Center in Atlanta. Uh, make sure to follow us, uh, MS Focus, on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for times and access information. Um, and please make sure to fill out the survey that's going to pop up right after we log off. If you do that for us, that would be uh, fantastic. And our sincere thanks to all the attendees, your questions and participation, and especially to Dr. Boster. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, everyone have a great evening.